My name is Rachel, a 30-year-old employed at a foreign investment firm. I tied the knot with Kevin, my husband, two years ago. He serves as a civil servant, though his employment is on a yearly contract basis, causing him annual apprehension over contract renewals. Kevin's family staunchly champions the merits of public service. With retired county workers as parents and a sister currently employed in the city office, their allegiance to public service is unwavering. Consequently, there's a noticeable air of disdain towards my private sector occupation. Living under the same roof since our marriage, they seize every opportunity to diminish the significance of my profession. Isn't it embarrassing to work for a foreign company as an American, especially in finance? Isn't that just about chasing profits? People in private sectors are perceived as those who couldn't secure public service roles, and those in foreign companies are seen as settling because they couldn't land a domestic job. It's a pity, they often remark. It appears that my husband, who was raised in such an environment, also holds public service in high esteem, despite the instability of his position and its modest salary. He remains steadfast in his attachment to this precarious job. Once, during his annual bout of anxiety around fiscal year-end, I ventured to ask Kevin, wouldn't you feel more secure with a stable full-time position in a regular company rather than remaining a part-time employee in public service? His response was resolute, I'd rather face unemployment than venture into the private sector. Kevin hasn't disclosed his part-time status to his parents, insisting that I maintain the secret as well. Despite lacking a substantial role, he fabricates tales of promotions to uphold his pride. I don't believe he needs to fabricate such stories, but it seems he's striving to earn respect in the eyes of his parents and younger sister by portraying a certain status. Despite never showing me his pay slip, the amount deposited into our account suggests his salary is rather modest. With Kevin's recent promotion to section chief, one would expect a significant salary increase, right? How much is he earning now? Caught off guard, Kevin accidentally divulged my salary. However, instead of the anticipated reaction, his father seemed taken aback, questioning, is that the standard income nowadays? While I'm uncertain of the exact salary of a public sector chief, I do know that, as a bond trader, my earnings are considerably higher. A notable portion of my earnings comes from commissions. Lately, my performance has been consistently strong, resulting in a salary far surpassing the norm. Upon learning the figures, my husband remarked, while his mother nodded in agreement, times have changed, but it's clear Kevin is highly regarded. She seemed visibly pleased. Kevin's sister, employed at the city office, joined the conversation, asserting, You see, working at the county office guarantees higher earnings for my brother. He might even hold a department head position if he were in the city office. Kevin's discomfort was palpable after inadvertently revealing my salary. Realizing his mistake, he quickly tried to steer the conversation in a different direction. Oh, by the way, I saw someone from the housing manufacturer around here the other day. Are we planning to remodel the house? He asked. Indeed, a salesperson from a housing company had recently visited to assist us. Seizing the opportunity to divert the conversation, I suggested, if we are considering a renovation, I'd recommend focusing on the kitchen. Before I could finish, my mother-in-law cut me off sharply. No, as the daughter-in-law, you have no place in family discussions. Just keep quiet and follow instructions. It seemed my intimidating mother-in-law disliked everything I did or said, primarily because I wasn't a civil servant. She also resented that I received all of Kevin's salary and gave him an allowance. Believing Kevin's claim that he earned a substantial income, she was convinced I was managing his finances. In reality, Kevin's modest salary mostly funded his personal expenses, while I covered nearly all the household costs. My sister-in-law didn't contribute to the living expenses at all. Why would you take living expenses from us when we're living on a pension? Kevin is making so much, you don't need it, they would say, refusing to help. They didn't have to pay rent, and I could manage with my salary alone. But it felt unfair. Despite shouldering most of the financial burden, I wasn't allowed to participate in the home renovation discussion this time. So, I retreated to the kitchen to clean up after dinner, promising myself the next time would be different. Neither my mother-in-law nor my sister-in-law helps with the housework, so I hurry home after work to cook, clean, and do laundry. In this respect, working for a foreign-owned company has its advantages. As long as I perform well, there's no need for overtime, allowing me to always leave on time and keep my work and private life separate. Kevin, on the other hand, 
often brings his work home and spends his days off on his computer. I worry about the security of bringing work data home. When I asked him about it, he snapped. I can't help it. I get yelled at if I work overtime and even more if I don't finish on time. It's not your concern, so don't butt in. His response was harsh, and he has been particularly grumpy lately, snapping at me whenever I try to talk to him. He even yelled at me when I brought up the housing issue he had been discussing with his parents. Just like mom always said, it's none of your business, you just need to follow what's been decided. I was growing increasingly frustrated with Kevin's attitude. He never shared anything with me despite my bearing the burden of living expenses and housework. One day, a representative from the construction company came to my in-law's house with a computer, discussing the layout and other aspects of the house with everyone except me. When I brought them tea and tried to sneak a peek, they immediately yelled, You don't need to look, just go away. From my brief glance, I was surprised to see what appeared to be the floor plan of a new house, not a renovation of my in-law's home. For some time, my father-in-law had mentioned that their house was getting cramped and that he wanted to rebuild it, but I had a thought he was serious. It seems my in-laws, both retired civil servants, received generous retirement allowances and are planning to build and live in a new house with that money. In addition to their retirement allowances, they haven't spent much of their pension either. Since marrying into the family, I assumed they had ample funds, so I tried to stay out of their financial decisions. However, one thing did bother me. Would Kevin's sister still be living with us in the new home? At 28, it might be time for her to get married, but there hasn't been any discussion about that. It seems highly likely she will continue living with us even after the move. This wouldn't be a problem if she helped with the housework, but she tends to dump all the chores on me and then complains about it, saying, it's too troublesome. I wish my sister-in-law would get married soon. But recently, I overheard my father-in-law discussing plans with the home builder. Can we add extra rooms so that when our daughter finds a husband, they can also live here? Ideally, we'd like a house where my wife and I, our son, our daughter, and her future husband can all live together, he said. I was shocked to hear this, especially since it seemed they were planning for my sister-in-law to live with us even after she marries. I can only imagine how large a house for three families would need to be, and it probably wouldn't fit on their current property. Considering that the new house would be built with my in-law's retirement fund and my sister-in-law's earnings, I have no right to complain. Still, I can't help but think about how much of a hassle it will be to clean such a large house. Then, my husband and his family decided to visit the showcase room and construction site, telling me to stay home because it's none of your business. My mother-in-law shouted at me with a nasty grin, clearly expecting a retort. She looked annoyed when I remained quiet. The construction of the new home proceeded without any information being shared with me, and my in-laws and sister-in-law started preparing to move out. My husband didn't seem to be preparing anything, so I asked, Don't you need to be getting ready to move? Why would I do it? That's your job. My husband snapped back at me. I was taken aback since he hadn't even told me when and where we were moving. From then on, I started preparing for the move whenever I had time, but I made sure to separate my husband's things from mine. The whole new home move-out incident had completely shattered my trust in my husband, and I could no longer bear my mother-in-law's terrible attitude. Even when I asked my husband about our new address, he simply replied, You don't need to know. Just be prepared. From snippets of conversation during meals, I gathered that the move was imminent, but it was strange that they kept me, the wife, completely in the dark. Perhaps they thought of me as nothing more than a maid. One day, the moving service arrived, and that was when I finally learned we were moving. As I hurriedly cleaned up the breakfast dishes, my mother-in-law remarked, We're buying new ones, so you can leave those. And are you planning to move into our new home with us? In that moment, it became clear. They hadn't told me about their new home or the moving date because they intended to kick me out. As I saw my husband standing silently behind my mother-in-law, a smirk playing on his lips, I couldn't help but wonder if he shared her intentions. Well, I had anticipated something like this so I had already packed my belongings separately, without a trace of agitation. I met her gaze squarely. I despise everything about you. From now on, we're going to live as a family without you. Do whatever you want. My mother-in-law shouted at me, her tone filled with disdain. My sister-in-law watched with indifference, perhaps expecting me to break down and beg to stay. My mother-in-law's displeasure deepened at my lack of reaction. You're a parasite, leeching off Kevin's paycheck since the day you got married. 
Get out now. We need Kevin's salary to pay off the mortgage on our new home, she spat out, her words sharp with resentment. Parasites like you are a nuisance, she seethed, her anger palpable as her face flushed red. While I had already planned on leaving, the revelation about my husband's salary being used for repayment almost made me burst out laughing. My husband appeared shocked, unaware of this arrangement. He gazed at his mother, then downcast, unable to speak the truth. His reaction revealed that my in-laws intended to rely solely on Kevin, whom they perceived as a high earner, to handle the mortgage repayments without tapping into their retirement funds. The prospect of how they would manage the mortgage repayments intrigued me. With a smile, I responded, understood. I will divorce Kevin, and you can all move to your new place by yourselves, I declared calmly. My mother-in-law, clearly displeased with my composed demeanor, appeared as though she wanted to say more, but she was ushered out of the house by my father-in-law and sister-in-law. Turning to Kevin, who remained behind, I said, I'll bring the divorce papers, so give me the address of your new place. I have no idea what your magnificent new home looks like, so I would like to see it once. Reluctantly, he provided me with the address. With little luggage remaining, I cheerfully arranged for a friend to help me move out using her car. I made sure to switch all the bills to be under Kevin's name rather than mine, utilities and everything included. Returning to my parents' house for the time being, I decided to head to the address Kevin had given me to have him sign the divorce papers. Their new house was strikingly large, designed to accommodate three generations with its grand architecture looming impressively. Upon spotting me, my mother-in-law hurried over, shouting, What are you doing here, you parasitic wife? Ignoring her tirade, I calmly asked Kevin to sign the divorce papers. Reluctantly, he complied, while his mother continued her verbal assault. I knew it. A non-civil servant wife is useless. Hurry up and sign, and send her away, she insisted. I couldn't resist a retort. Such a splendid new house. The payments must be quite the burden, aren't they? Can Kevin's salary cover it? I remarked snidely, watching as she read the papers, her anger palpable. I don't need your concern. Take the divorce papers and leave immediately, she snapped once again. I lingered for a moment. Observing my ex-husband's pale expression, but with his mother on the brink of eruption, I swiftly retrieved the divorce papers and filed them at City Hall before embarking on my search for a new home. After all that transpired, the thought of marriage lost its ire, so I opted for a cozy studio apartment to relish living independently. There was a charming spot conveniently close to my workplace, so I wasted no time in making the move. In my new abode, Devoid of anyone foisting chores upon me or boasting about civil service, life took on a tranquil hue. Just as I was settling into this newfound peace, an unknown number lit up my phone screen. Rachel, can you come back to me? I can't keep up with the mortgage payments, let alone the utilities. My phone lines have been cut off, and I'm borrowing my friend's phone to call you. It was none other than my ex-husband, Kevin. Through tears, he pleaded for help, but I couldn't help but feel exasperated. Instead of turning to me, he should have sought assistance from his parents or his sister. So I responded essily, why not ask your sister, who's employed in public service, for support? And what about your parents? Surely they have their retirement savings and social security. Kevin's discomfort was evident as he confessed. Actually, my parents have depleted their retirement savings, and my sister is grappling with her own financial troubles. It turned out that Kevin's parents had fallen prey to an investment scam, losing a significant portion of their retirement funds. Meanwhile, Kevin's sister, under the impression that she didn't need to aid her parents financially, had been recklessly accumulating debt through excessive spending on credit. Upon learning of my occupation in investments, my mother-in-law's demeanor turned openly hostile. Now I wonder if her animosity stemmed from being swindled in an investment scam. Furthermore, it seems they were keen on upholding their social standing through ostentatious purchases, perhaps to preserve their pride in their public service careers. However, despite their efforts, Kevin's parents found themselves burdened with debt, relying on their social security checks to meet their obligations. I was taken aback to discover that Kevin's sister, despite her youth, had amassed significant debt by indulging in purchases of branded goods on credit. The situation took a further downturn when Kevin revealed, Actually, I've been let go. I'm unemployed now. He had lost his job this year after being caught working remotely with data he had taken from the office. He should have heeded my warning, but it's hardly surprising, considering he was taking confidential data out of the office. 
Even before Kevin lost his job, his family was already grappling with financial difficulties, reliant on my income. Kevin never disclosed to his parents that he was only a part-timer. Likewise, his parents concealed the loss of their retirement funds due to a scam, and even his younger sister kept her substantial debt hidden. In their public service-oriented family, filled with pride, everyone harbored deep secrets that somehow remained hidden as long as I was around. However, after they moved to their new home and I departed, their financial struggles came to light. As a last resort, Kevin reached out to me, seeking assistance. However, I had no desire to reconcile with him, so I firmly declined and ended the call. Despite my refusal, he persisted with repeated calls but eventually ceased after I continued to ignore him. Some time later, as I passed by their new house, I noticed a for sale sign. Upon speaking with a home builder present at the site, I learned that they were struggling to meet their mortgage payments and had to sell the property quickly. However, they still had outstanding debts. It was ironic considering how they had previously boasted about their financial stability. Yet, when faced with financial difficulties, they swiftly sold their home, placing a burden on a relative who had co-signed the loan. According to the builder, this relative worked in the private sector, exacerbating the family's embarrassment as they were now ostracized by their relatives. Their previous claims of being public servants no longer held weight, and they were looked down upon by their community. Sitting comfortably at home, I couldn't help but smirk at the thought of how the once proud family, now isolated by their relatives and unable to flaunt their public service jobs, were faring.